So now that I'm back, we can finally finish the mini-series that we began over a month ago now, where we were looking at how we grow, how we follow God's commandment to grow in our relationship with him. And if you remember, this is a part of the bigger series that we've been in that I've entitled This is Love, where we've been looking at how we love God by walking according to God's commandments. And so a few uh, weeks ago, we looked at how we follow God's commandment to grow in our relationship with him through study and through prayer. And so this morning, we're going to finish up this part of our big series by looking at how we grow through fasting. And fasting is one of those things that many of us have probably never done before. It's something that I would venture to say the majority of us have probably read about before in the Bible, but we either don't know how to do it, or we don't know if it's something that we should be doing today. Because you see, fasting is one of those things that a lot of the times is looked at as something that was done back then. It was something that was done back in Bible times. It was something that's done by other groups of people. But it's not something that we should do today. However, I would like to say that I firmly believe that fasting can still have a vital impact on our relationship with God. And so it should be something that we as Christians continue to practice today. And I believe that, first off, because Jesus fasted. In Matthew chapter 4, we see that before Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, that he spends time fasting. We also see in the text that was read for us a moment ago from Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus assumed that his followers would fast because when he teaches his followers about fasting, he says, when you fast, expecting that this is something that they're going to do. As well as in the book of Acts, we see that the church fasted. And there's historical evidence to show the importance of the practice of fasting within the early church during the first three centuries. And so if fasting was something that was important enough for Jesus to do, and important enough for the early church to do, and if fasting was something that Jesus expected that his followers would take part in, then I believe that fasting is probably something that we today as Christians should give a little bit more attention to than we do. And so that leads us to the question of how do we fast? And in order to answer that, the first thing that we need to do is back up and define what fasting is. And so fasting is typically defined as the abstaining from food and or drink for a set period of time. And fasting was, and I believe still is, used for three primary purposes relating to our relationship with God. First off, In denying ourselves or taking away a need that we have, this allows us to focus on God. So for example, when when we take away the desire and need for food when we don't eat, what that does is it gives us the time that would normally be spent in preparing a meal or in eating a meal, and we can now take that time to focus on God. Fasting also allows us to realize our dependence upon God as our ultimate sustainer. You see, our physical needs are of vital importance. And I know that all of us know this because in fulfilling our physical needs, that's actually the thing that keeps us alive. But when we forego those needs for a set period of time, what that does is it allows us to focus on God as our sustainer and realize that it is God who is the ultimate one that provides for those needs that we have. And lastly, fasting is an act of humility. When we fast before God, we recognize our weaknesses and our needs before the almighty God of heaven and earth who created us, we are better able to realize who we are as weak and finite human beings before the ultimate and powerful and perfect God whom we serve. And so what we see throughout history is fasting used in many different situations in order to accomplish those three things. To allow a person to focus on God, to depend upon God, and to humble themselves. 
before God. And so we can go all the way back to the Old Testament and see the way that fasting was used in the Old Testament. And what we see is that in the Old Testament that there were both public fasts and individual fasts. And the only commanded public fast that we see in the Old Testament, and this would have been a fast that was to be observed by the entire Israelite nation, was a fast on the Day of Atonement. And if you remember, the Day of Atonement was the day when the high priest would enter into the most holy place of the temple or of the tabernacle in order to offer a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, to God on behalf of the sins of the people. But as time went on, there became more public fasts that were observed by the nation of Israel, even though they were never specifically commanded by God. But in addition to public fasts that we see throughout the Old Testament, we also see individual fasts. And these were fasts that would be done by an individual or a group of individuals based on something that was going on in that person's life or maybe something that was going on in the Israelite community as a whole. And what we see is that there were three primary reasons in the Old Testament for which an individual might fast. And the first is that individuals would fast as part of mourning. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 12, we see David and his men fast after hearing about Saul's death. It says, And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. So the Israelites would fast as a part of their mourning. But we also see in the Old Testament that the Israelites might fast fast as part of their repentance and confession before God. In 1 Samuel 7 and verse 6, we see the nation of Israel fast after leaving their worship of foreign gods to once again come back and serve the Lord. It says that they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mitzpah. But also, we see in the Old Testament that an individual might fast in order to elicit the guidance or the action or the direction of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we see Jehoshaphat issue a fast for the entire nation of Judah when the Moabites and the Ammonites seek to come against and to fight against the nation of Judah, and this fast results in God delivering the nation from their enemies. Notice what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Munites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Skipping down to verse 22. And when they had begun to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. So what we see in the Old Testament is that Israelites would fast as a part of Mourning, repentance, and in order to receive guidance or direction or action from God. And I would also like to point out that fasting in the Old Testament is almost always associated with prayer. Because you see, those three reasons that we see that an individual might fast in the Old Testament are all connected with that person's relationship with God. And so it makes sense that if fasting is connected to one's relationship with God, that a part of fasting would be to communicate with God, to have an open dialogue of prayer with God. And so what we see throughout all of this in the Old Testament is that those three purposes of fasting that we talked about, that fasting allows a person to focus on God, to depend upon God, and to humble themselves before God, are all directly connected to the reasons that we see Israel fast in the Old Testament. 
You see, because when Israel was in a time of mourning, what fasting would do would be to allow them to focus and depend upon God to provide them comfort and to get them through this period of mourning. When Israel found themselves in times of sin, what fasting would do would be to allow them to humble themselves as sinners before the perfect God whom they serve and to depend upon God and God's grace to deal with the problem of sin that they found themselves in. That's why God issues a fast for the entire nation of Israel on the Day of Atonement, on the day when a sacrifice was offered for the sins of the people. Because in doing that, God is asking Israel to focus on God and to realize their dependence upon God and God's grace to deal with that problem of sin as humble sinners who are coming before their righteous God. And then, during times of war or of famine or of hardship for the nation, when they needed the guidance or the action of God, fasting would once again allow them to focus and to depend upon God, to seek to receive from God the guidance and the action that the nation so desperately needed. But as time goes on, as we approach the world of the New Testament, as we approach the world of the first century, what we begin to see is that this Jewish understanding of fasting begins to change. During the time of Jesus, the second temple Jews, those Jews that were alive during the first century, during the days when Christ walked the earth, had begun to change the meaning of fasting and they had not changed it for the better. Rather than being a way of humble dependence upon God, fasting in the first century had become a mark of the pious Jews. It had become a very external act that was used to differentiate the truly good and holy Jews from the average Jew. As well as fasting had begun to be associated with the dualism that existed in the first century as it was viewed by many Jews as an ascetic practice. That is, many Jews believed that by denying the needs of their body, that they would make their soul or their spirit more perfect, more blameless, and more holy before God. And so this change from the original Old Testament concept of fasting that we see take place within the Jews of the first century is actually the very thing that we see Jesus speak out against when He teaches on fasting. You see, because when Jesus comes on the scene, what He does is begins to speak against this newfound way of fasting and really tries to bring His followers and His disciples back to the original Old Testament concept of fasting. And we see this first off in the way that Jesus fasts. I mentioned earlier, In Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus fast before going out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And He does this in order to depend and rely on the guidance of God during this time of temptation, very much like we see fasting used in the Old Testament. Because you see, Jesus knew that this time of temptation was going to be an important moment in His life. As well as in this moment, Jesus is preparing Himself to begin His earthly ministry, preparing Himself to go out on the most important mission that any man has ever begun. And so in preparation for these two life-altering events, His temptation out in the wilderness and beginning His life-saving mission into the world, Jesus begins by taking time to fast so that He can focus, depend, and humble Himself before God to receive guidance from God, not just during His temptation, but so that God will be the ultimate guide throughout His entire life earthly ministry. Not only that, but when we see Jesus teach His followers about fasting, we see Him change the emphasis of fasting from the outward focus that it had become back to a focus on God as we saw in the Old Testament. Notice again what Jesus says to His followers in the text in Matthew 6 that was read for us earlier. Jesus tells his followers, he says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. 
And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, what Jesus does here is He seeks to reorient the people's understanding of fasting. He says that the point of fasting is not to show other people how good and how perfect and how holy and how righteous you are, but He says the point of fasting is to take place in your relationship with God. It's to focus on God, depend upon God, and humble yourself before God, not to show other people. And later on in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 9, we see Jesus once again teach about fasting. Matthew says that the disciples of John come to Jesus and they ask Him, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus answers them and says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. You see, Jesus here once again, seeks to remind His followers of the original purpose of fasting. As we've talked about, fasting was used during times of mourning and of repentance and of guidance in a person's relationship with God because it allowed them to focus, depend, and humble themselves before God. But what Jesus is saying here is that a new time has come. He's saying that his followers are relating to God in a different way at this moment because God is actually right there with them. God is standing right beside them in the man of Jesus Christ. So what Jesus is saying is while I am here, while God is standing next to you, there's no reason for you to do these things. But Jesus says when I leave, you once again are to return to the original or the old way of fasting. Return back to that original understanding of fasting. And so this understanding of fasting, when Jesus tries to bring His followers back to that Old Testament understanding of fasting, we see this continue in the way that the early church in Acts practiced fasting. Because in Acts chapter 13, we see that the church fasted prior to sending out missionaries. Luke writes this, he says, And... There were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And when they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, we see that the church fasted prior to the appointment of elders. It says, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You see, once Jesus left, His followers then went back to the practice of fasting. And they didn't fast in order to show other people how good of Christians they were, like the Jews had begun to do, but they did it as a part of their intimate relationship with God. They did it so that the church was able to do those three things, so that they were able to focus and to depend upon God and to humble themselves before God in order to receive guidance and direction from God when important decisions in the church had to be made. Decisions like the sending out of missionaries and the appointment of elders. And so, I want to close this morning by answering this question. What does all of this mean for us today? What does this teaching of fasting that we see throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and then Jesus trying to get us back to that understanding in the Old Testament, the practice in the church, what does this mean for us today in the 21st century in regards to our fasting? And the first thing that I want to say is that I believe that we as Christians should practice fasting. Because you see, the things that fasting accomplishes, focusing on God, depending upon God, humbling ourselves before God are always important practices to be done by the people of God. 
Not only that, but it will always, always be strengthening in our relationship with God when we remember who we are in relation to God. And when we deny ourselves a need that we have, what that does is it forces us to rely and to depend upon God and to recognize that it is God who is the ultimate one who provides for every single one of our needs. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, if fasting was important enough for Jesus and the early church to do, and if it was something that Jesus expected that his followers would do, and it's probably something that we as Christians and followers of Jesus should consider doing. So how do we do it? How do we go about fasting? Does fasting have to necessarily be done by abstaining from food? And, I, you know, I, I don't really think that fasting necessarily has to be done with food, even though I think food is definitely the easiest way to do it. But what fasting needs to do is we need to make sure that it accomplishes those three goals, that it gives us time to focus on God, that it allows us to realize our dependence upon God, and it's an act that causes us to humble ourselves before God. So while abstaining from food is definitely an easy way to accomplish those three things, so would not doing an activity, for example. Let's say that there was an activity that you do on a daily basis. And so you decide for a week that you're going to stop doing that activity and you're going to take the time that would normally be spent doing that and you're going to focus on God and you're going to realize your dependence upon God for providing you the time or the ability or the money to do whatever activity that is that you're giving up. You see, that would accomplish the very same thing. So the point is, is that there's multiple ways that we can go about fasting, but we must be diligent that whatever we're doing, we're doing to accomplish those three things. But if we do decide to fast with food, like I said, I think that's the easiest way to do it. We don't necessarily have to do it by not eating for the entire day, even though that's something that we can do. We can decide we're not going to eat for an entire day or several days in a row and spend that time focusing on God. But we could also do it by giving up a meal and spending that time focusing on God. Or we could decide that we're not going to eat during the day and we're only going to eat at night. And we can string these together for several days in a row and maybe we decide that we're not going to eat a meal in the evening for several days and we're going to spend our time when we get home from work focusing on God or maybe we decide that we're not going to eat during the day and only eat at night for several days in a row and spend our time during the day focusing on God. Again, the point that I want to make is there's several ways for us to do it. We just simply need to be doing it. You need to find what works best for you and what fits best into your schedule that accomplishes those three things and do it. And I also want to mention, once again, the importance of understanding the connection between fasting and prayer. As I've mentioned a couple of times throughout this lesson, throughout the Bible, in the Old and New Testament, we very rarely see fasting take place apart from prayer, because as we've talked about, fasting is related to a relationship with God, and so it makes sense to spend time praying to God as part of of our fasting. And so several weeks ago, we talked about uh, some ways in which we go about praying. And so I think it would be beneficial to us to implement some of those things about prayer into the practice of fasting. So when do we fast? I think in answering that question, we would do good to think about that Old Testament understanding of fasting that we talked about, as well as the practice of fasting that we see in the early church. And so I believe that it would be beneficial to us to fast first during times of mourning. When we find ourselves in difficult situations and we are wanting God to act within the midst of the situation that we found ourselves in, what better way to accomplish that than through fasting? Because fasting not only gives us a time to focus on God, but it also causes us to realize our dependence upon God to get us out of 
of whatever difficult situation that we found ourselves in, rather than trying to rely on only ourselves apart from God. You see, what fasting does is it helps to correctly orient our lives and our thoughts around the situations that we found ourselves in. So we stop trying to do everything ourselves, trying to get out of every bad situation by ourselves, and it forces us to focus and depend upon God to aid us in those times. Not only that, but I think fasting is beneficial during times of repentance. If you've been living a life that's been characterized by sin and are making the decision to come back to God, fasting, just like with mourning, can help to reorient your life around what truly matters. To help you realize that your focus and your devotion on God is what matters. Help you to realize your dependence upon God and God's grace to forgive you of that life of sin that you've been living and your dependence upon His Spirit to empower you to live in the way that God has called you to live. It helps you realize that we cannot do this on our own. That we cannot look only to ourselves, but we must rely and depend upon God. And lastly, fasting should be practiced and can be beneficial to us during times of guidance. And this could be guidance in our personal lives or guidance, focused guidance for us as a church family. You see, because in our personal lives we could be seeking to be making important decisions and we want God's guidance in those moments. Or, like the early church, when we as a church are in the business of making important decisions, like the appointing of elders and the hiring of ministers, fasting can come in handy because, once again, it it forces us to focus on God and to depend upon God to be our guide during those times when important decisions are being made. But not only that, but it shows that we are willing to depend upon God to be the guiding force force in our lives and the guiding force for us as a church. And so as we close today, here is my challenge to you. I would like to challenge us as a church to all try to practice fasting this week. Figure out how you can fit it in to your schedule, what works best for you, and give fasting a try this week and just see what it does for your relationship with God. And I would also deeply encourage you to make a part of your practice of fasting this week to think about the important things that are going on at this church here. You see, because in a few moments we are going to be appointing two new elders. And this is an exciting and an important time in our history as a church. This is a great new phase that we are entering. And so my encouragement for you is when you give fasting a try this week, as part of that, ask for God's blessing upon our eldership and His guidance as they seek to lead us as a church. As well as all of you probably know that we are in the process of trying to find a youth minister. And so again, I would encourage you that as part of your fasting and prayer to ask God for His guidance and blessing on that search, that we would be able to find the right man for the job. You see, because these things are very closely related to the reasons that we see the church fast in Acts. And so I am a firm believer that they are reasons that we as the church in White House should fast as we enter this new phase with new elders and as we are in the process of making a decision and finding a man to work with our youth here. It will be a great blessing to you to practice fasting this week and it will be a blessing to us as a church for the things that we have going on here. So that's my encouragement for you this morning. That's my challenge for you. And if we can help you in any way this morning, you can come as we stand and as we sing. Let's rise up.